stretching from the inside passage of the southeast to the frozen shores of the Arctic Ocean, Alaska has more coastline than the rest of the United States combined. The area we're looking at from all the way down to Ketchikan, up to Barrow and out past Adak, within the, the U.S. exclusive economic zone is 1.5 million square miles. This vast stretch of waterway is the lifeblood of the communities of the northern United States. Beneath the waves, marine mammals, salmon, and other fisheries provide food security and add to the local economy. On the surface, barges carrying the community's provisions navigate these same waters that international shippers use. This poses a challenge and a responsibility for national interests and our international relations. Prevention and response for oil spills is completely contingent on industry. All our rules and laws require them to prevent spills and adequately respond. So any spill that would occur from um, most of uh, anywhere in Alaska is, is already from a company that has the assets and the skills to deal with it. Uh, the only gap that exists that I'm aware of is vessels in Innocent Passage. Vessels traveling from one international port to another off the Alaskan coast in federal waters are considered to be an innocent passage. This international law of the sea states, vessels don't have to comply with the country's laws if they are only traveling through their waters. The local communities really have no role, and, and I know that's a frustrating position for them. They're taking all the risk for vessels, for example, coming or going from Russia through the Bering Straits, and yet they have no ability to deal with a problem if that vessel has an issue in that passage. Faced with the challenge and responsibility of ensuring safety at sea, the emergency response capabilities of the U.S. Coast Guard are limited in northern Alaska. Though some Coast Guard presence does exist, at this time, there are no permanent bases. What this graphic shows is historical traffic for a period of two weeks up in the Arctic. And different color codes have then represent different types of vessels. So, for instance, this blue vessel is involved in support of the shell operation, so therefore it's going to different regions and doing research also. Uh, this, this vessel right here happens to be the state vessel Sekuliak, which is doing checking the ice edge, so that's why it's going all over the place. So you have tugs and barges, landing craft, research vessels, vessels in support of oil exploration efforts, different types of vessels, and in some cases, uh, a cruise vessel or a passenger vessel will be operating in that region. Instead of reacting to some kind of a disaster that might happen with the uh, large ships and barges throughout the coast of northern Alaska, we formed this Arctic Waterway Safety Committee to develop a plan so that all the mariners, whether you're a large ship or a tourist ship, or you're bringing fuel into the communities, or if you're a hunter, everybody can be safe with this plan because it makes every, every other ship aware of the hunting activities going on the coast in northern Alaska. This was a result of Arctic Alaskans' desire to keep their hunters safe. Following the Exxon Valdez incident, the state realized that it had a stake and impacted whenever an incident happened with ships you know, laying down the beach or causing oil spills, what have you. And so they took a little more proactive role and actually used some of the settlement money from the Exxon Valdez to develop a maritime safety net. And that's what we've basically been funded partially by the state of Alaska to build a safety net so we can monitor vessels and validate compliance with risk mitigating measures, identify when they're in trouble, and identify and locate vessels that can provide assistance. All this is oriented towards saving lives and protecting the environment. This tracking system logs the movements of about 4,000 ships worldwide and provides another layer of response time should a disaster happen. But there is still no law requiring vessels in innocent passage to register with this safety net. And the main tools available to the community or where they, they are usually are the most engaged is what we call geographic response strategies. And that's where perhaps you have a rookery that you want to protect. So that's already pre-identified in this government response plan. And we already know what equipment we need to go protect that rookery. We need this much boom and here's where you anchor it and you need this kind of vessel to get the boom out there. And, and we have all those details figured out in advance so we're much quicker. Uh, whatever the community feels is the most important, they can tell us in advance and then we can help design the, the process to protect that area. 
This continuing collaboration at all levels of state government, along with tribal, industry, and non-government organizations, is the fulfillment of the One Arctic mission. The mission now is to plug the gaps. The state of Alaska should push for U.S.-Canada agreements that will require environmental protections and marine safety standards on vessels traveling in innocent passage through Alaska waters on their way to or from Canada. If the U.S. just decided to require it, all of a sudden, you know, it'd be more profitable for the ships to go to Canadian ports because they would have, it's be less expensive. And we don't want that. But if both countries do it, then pretty much every ship coming or going through the Gulf of Alaska would have to, or end up north if they're going around to Canada that way, would have to comply. So we're, we're really pushing that as something that the state of Alaska has a real vested interest in. Spilled oil knows no boundaries. These agreements between Canada, Russia, and the U.S. would require vessels traveling in innocent passage to comply with agreed-upon prevention standards and regulations. As activity in this region increases, America must enhance our capacity for securing and protecting the livelihood of the Arctic. Establishing security and protection in the Arctic begins at the community level through sub-area planning for disaster response. At the state level, the Department of Environmental Conservation has a unified plan that requires communities, state agencies, the industry, and volunteers to work together. At the national level, federal allocation of prevention and response assets are required, along with continued assessment, as in the Port Access Route Study and others like it. At the international level, Reciprocal port agreements ensure that America's interests are protected. Participation is required from all nations vested in the waterways to assure a safe and thriving Arctic. <laughs>